What's good everyone and welcome back to Kaya's Commentary and if you're new here, welcome to Kaya's Commentary. This is a podcast that offers commentary on pop culture topics, real world issues, anything in between, and maybe even some advice every now and then. Before we get down to it, you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kaya R. Pennington and you can follow Kaya's Commentary on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kaya's Commentary. Also, be sure to hit the follow slash subscribe button and the bell so you get notified when new videos drop. With that, let's kick it into our first segment, Online Discourse, where I give my commentary on piece of online discourse I've seen. Today's discourse, first person prefers versus third person prefers. And this is actually kind of like a part two to like last week where I was talking about like letting adults read YA. So we're jumping from what genre you're allowed to read to what POV you're allowed to read. And like, so someone on TikTok um, posted their book preference. So like when you buy a book and you're excited to read it and then you find out it's in third person. Someone screenshotted that, uh, uploaded it to Twitter and was like, book talk has rotted y'all brains because what do you mean you can't read third person? This is the problem with book talk. Yeah, da, 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 da. Um, and it's just set this chain like off. I've seen, <laughs> since that, I've seen a lot of people say like, hey, this is the problem with book talk. People who prefer first person are childish. They want to self insert. They are illiterates who physically cannot read a third person, the classics, because, you know, a lot of the classics are written in third person. So like, you know, there's just, I've just seen them going off. And to be fair, I've seen first person uh, prefers go off on third person prefers every now and then but every time this conversation pops off a lot more I've seen third person prefers go off on first person prefers very snobby at that very snobby now back in season two I of Kai's commentary I did kind of make like an unpopular opinion about or maybe it was season one I don't know but I made an unpopular opinion about how you know I prefer first person and didn't really know that third person was uh more liked and that there was this whole debate I want to say here and now I'm not speaking from a like experienced or insulted uh point of view like oh how dare you say all these things about first person you know I'm a first person reading I'm not saying any of that I just I've seen a lot of third person prefers be really snobby with it and that kind of pisses me off like um because a lot of these people and yes since we're generalizing let me go ahead and generalize a lot of these people are, will be some of the same people who couldn't read the classics in high school like y'all didn't like the classics in high school y'all didn't like third person in high school uh but now you found the error of your ways you join the party as someone who likes the classic you join the party welcome to it it's lit over here but the example that i'll use don't come to the wine sipping party acting like you got wine in your cup and you sipping on wine with the rest of us when in actuality you sipping on rum and coke y'all are getting real snobby to only a year ago not have liked the classics or third person pov you might have always liked third person pov but you didn't like the classics and you're so you're associating the classics and that kind of that form of literature with third person and you getting this elitist opinion in your head that you're better and like i don't like that i don't like that out of all the things we could blame book talk for because nine times out of ten i'll be right to actually ten times out of ten well i guess nine times because this is one where i'm not rocking with you um so nine times out of ten i will be right there down with you to crap talk book talk bookstagram or book twitter because a lot of the sexual assaulting smut that it sells is branded as romance when it's really horror and a lot of these people did not have wattpad faces to let them know that they aren't real writers <laughs> like i will crap talk wattpad a lot as well but the thing that i've learned is that we need wattpad you know a lot of people need they miss that wattpad phase where you go there write any kind of thing and, and learn the different ways of writing and what works and what's better and then go be a published writer no a lot of people are skipping this and just writing anything and getting published and that's not cool like that's not cool so I, i'll be right there down with you to critique book talk books around book twitter this ain't one of them though like i said i prefer first person my excuse for preferring my reasoning rather for preferring first person is a known one um it just flows better for me i want to be inside the character's head i view it as like a journal like they are the narrator because third person while i've read a lot of great third person because honestly i prefer first person but i will read a third person if the story is great i'm gonna read it i'm gonna read it if it just so happens to be in third person i rock with it 
because the story is interesting enough but the thing about especially when i was younger um third person would be like who is the narrator who is telling the story? Because when I go in to read a story about somebody and their lived experience, their life, I'm expecting them to tell me the story. But keep it to a level of like, um, like you're writing in your journal, like The Cruel Prince. When I reviewed The Cruel Prince this season, um, Jude has lines that's like, she's talking, she's talking, she's talking. Oh, yeah. And there are three things that you should know about me. She's breaking fourth wall. And it's like, don't do that. Because if you wanted that, to let me know that you're directly talking to me you should have like had um third person but outside of that i look at it like you know they are the narrators of their story without being overly narrating and telling you everything they're writing it down um my problem with third person sometimes is that you know sometimes they'll use all these flowery languages or long complex sentences um and it's like uh okay uh so it's like Oh, Kaya felt her rage that she's never felt before, and it was one that scared the devil out of Tartar, out of uh, Lucifer and Hades, and they, they would, they, they, her anger rivaled their, their level of angers. When in actuality, all I gotta say is Kaya was mad as hell. <laughs> Kaya was mad as hell. Like, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Like, and no, it's not, it's not a lack of intelligence. Because I promise y'all, y'all don't want to be calling me stupid. I'm not the one to go back and forth with that on. I excelled in my history and English courses. Y'all not, I'm not the one. But, because I will be real quick, especially like, um, even on simple stuff. Oh, I'm not going to, you write out a long paragraph. You're going back and forth with somebody and they're like, oh, I'm not going to read all of that. Oh, so you illiterate? Like, I will definitely be quick to call that person, but uh, illiterate. But I'm not going to do that because somebody wants to read a story with a little bit of simplicity because not every story requires all this flowery language long sentences keep it simple sometimes simple is better sometimes so I, i'm never gonna call someone stupid or illiterate just because they prefer a little bit more simplicity in stories well like i said if we're going back and forth my and my point is to anger you further i definitely will call you illiterate but you know just kind of nice to use that um that, that was kind of like my problem with third person. I've kind of gotten over it now. I'm older. Um, and even then, it didn't stop me from reading third person. It's just like, who was the narrator? And sometimes all this long flowery language, just my particular writing style, sometimes that's not needed. You don't have to say that Kaya anger rivaled and scared the the fool out of, out of Lucifer and Hades. She's just mad as hell. Like, sometimes simple is better. But... Um, so that's my reasoning for like wanting first person, but I can read a third person book. It, it really just depends. But um, I've seen people say that third person is the standard. And I just wonder, is that true? Because like a lot of classics are written in third person, but not all of them. And I don't know about Harry Potter and Percy Jackson, but I will list two of the most successful um the hunger games and divergent and i say successful or almost successful because these were the two that kind of honestly uh hyped up and were the end of why novels becoming book adaptation or movie adaptations for a hot minute they were written in first person they were written in first person like and I'm not, these are just two, but they're two of the most successful. And I'm sure the authors have written in third person before, but I'm just saying, like, is that really, is that really the, the standard? I, I don't, I don't know if it is. I've written, I've uh, read a lot of third person, but I've, even, I've read a greater chunk of first person. I don't know if that's the standard. As far as being childish, again, it's like, it's not childish. Sometimes simple is better. And like, personally, for me, it just feels better in my head. And honestly, um, you know, when you're writing essays and stuff, when you first start learning how to write essays, they tell you you write how you talk and to, like, not do that. So a lot of the time, outside of, like, formal writing, people write how they talk. And so if your character is in first person, it's like, it's not self-insert. I don't feel like it's just that the character is telling you the story and they're... It, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's easier. To write in first person because it's like 
you really have to sometimes personally anyway you have to think about like you can't just say oh yeah i'm i'm upset that upset me you have to say especially script writing you have to say this person is upset and you have to you have to do it in a playable action like you can't just say they're upset you have to write it in such a way where it's easily actable but that's in script writing and i imagine it's kind of the same in like book you in book format you have to write it in such a way that's easily pictured so um childish self inserts physically cannot read the classics uh as someone who does read the classics i can acknowledge that sometimes it is like uh, a little over the top like has anybody read the three musketeers i would consider that a classic maybe not jane austen type classic but i would consider that a classic and it's something that's we didn't read in a lot of us anyway didn't read in school and I wonder why, instead of reading the same three Shakespeare plays every year. Because there are lessons to be learned in the Three Musketeers. But it's a lot. It's a lot. It's, a, it's one of those books that I had to read on audio. I told y'all last week, I don't like audio books a lot because I can't... I, I had to really sit and focus while listening to that story. Um, so it's a lot. It can be a lot sometimes. Um, I... I don't think don't think you're better than people <laughs> because you prefer a third person because that's not a standard and the like the kind of stuff that people read because i've seen a lot of people say oh yeah fantasy should be in third person no it doesn't it, it depends on the story <laughs> it depends on the story the cruel prince i hate it but for the most part is a book that i feel like third person should not have been happening like it, it should have stayed in the first person and so when she broke that wall that fourth person wall it aggravated me because it's like one you've already made the decision to stay in first person two it's your story and it it works better that way and that's a fantasy right and so i've also seen third person people be like oh yeah it depends on the story well if it depends on the story why are you getting so up a first person prefers but about them liking first person like i think the issue is that a lot of y'all went to wattpad when you know wattpad was still free and and people were actually using it to to write and, and get better at writing perhaps but y'all went to these wattpad stories that was like your name and those self-insert stories and then got mad when it was poorly written self-inserts a first person don't get mad at the whole style because you ruined it for yourself because you know exactly what wattpad was and you know exactly what that your name wattpad first person wattpad story was don't get mad at the whole uh, style because you ruined it for yourself and again at your big age and you can't recognize that a lot of these people sucked at writing because they were adolescents who could not write maybe they've gotten better now maybe they haven't but it was rare for me anyway. It was rare to find a really good story on Wattpad. AO3 was where I uh, benefited as far as fanfic stories and well-written fanfic stories. Like, you played yourself. Congratulations. Don't get upset at the whole style and then get all, ooh, I almost said, I don't like the U word, uppity. I don't like that word, but I almost called y'all some uppities. Like, don't get snobby about it. Like, don't come to the wine sipping party acting like you're sipping wine in your cup and it's really rum and coke gin and juice like chill that's a quick little my commentary on uh ranty <laughs> my commentary on uh first person versus third person i depending on the story enjoy them both i just prefer first person a little bit more because it's easier style as far as writing goes and sometimes for the story it's better to be in their head for me that doesn't mean i'm trying to self insert or that i can't read the classics or that i'm childish like y'all do not just because a lot of the classics are written in third person get this elitist form that third person is better it really does depend on the story you can't say a whole genre deserves to be in third person that don't make sense because it depends on the story and who's telling the story stop being so elitist about it and snobby about it with that let's kick it into our second segment uh let's go to the movies where i give my commentary on a movie i've seen today's movie the people under the stairs this was a film i watched it's a suspense horror film and it was a film that i watched when i was pretty young and it stuck with me let's get into it so it opens up with a tarot reading of the card, The Fool, which speaks to our main character, Young Poindexter, aka Fool. 
So uh, he has a couple of younger siblings and a sickly mom that he's that's being cared for by his older sister Ruby. And it's clear they're in poverty. They the place that they're staying in, they're almost being evicted out of, or rather, really being evicted out of, because uh, Ruby's boyfriend Leroy comes in and tells them, "Hey, y'all the last family in this building, and the landlord wants y'all out so that they can tear the fan of the building down." But he's like, I have a way for you to make some coin, some actual legitimate gold coin to keep you and your family here. We are going to rob your landlord because I know where he stays. To the landlord who I would prefer, I will, uh, from here on out, I will call him daddy and I will call his wife mommy because that is their character's names. They don't really have that. The dad has a name towards the very end of the film we find out and it's only used once and so mommy and daddy <laughs> and they're being served dinner by their daughter Alice and she does make a comment I can't remember what comment it is because I didn't write it down um but the mommy is like speak when spoken to that's what good girls do and the landlord he's eating something that requires bullets being extracted from it I wonder what that could be Back to Fool, Ruby and Leroy are arguing about him because Leroy wants him to help rob the landlord and Ruby is like, keep my brother out of trouble. Um, but apparently the landlord has actual gold coins that will secure their future. Back to Alice and mommy and daddy. Alice is fed by mommy. <laughs> I, I Look, this is these are their names and it's just not comfortable for me to say, but these are their names. <laughs> And so she almost acts as if Alice is a doll by the way she brushes her hair. It's all kind of rough. And she's like, do you love your mother? And she's like, yes. And like, it's just, it's very clearly a weird relationship. Complicated further when we find out there's someone in the wall that Alice has been feeding. And we find out because Alice loses a fork. And mommy's like, where's the fork that I gave you? It's very clear that if Alice don't find their fork, she gonna get in trouble. Alex find, uh, Alice finds the fork but it's too late because daddy comes in and he's complaining about a robbery of their uh, corner store and uh, mommy tells daddy that alice is feeding the thing in the walls and she's to be punished but not to bruise her face and daddy has a line that's like bad girls burn in hell they very clearly have this weird relationship with good and bad quote unquote good and bad and what they deem good and bad and the concept of hell back to fool Leroy and his associate, Spencer, they are working with Fool, rather Fool is working with them. He's posing as a boy scout and he's scoping out the entrances and the property of the landlord's place. Um, Alice sees him in the window, but he sl she slips out of the window before he can see her. Mommy comes out and is like, what do you want? What are you doing? He's trying to sell her cookies or he's really trying to get entrance into the house, but she will not let him in and she sends him away. He goes back out to their truck that they're waiting in and this leads Spencer to going in. He's posing as a maintenance worker, which gains him access. It gains him access further when Leroy and Fool notes that Spencer is left alone in the house. And so Leroy and Fool go in. They enter in through an old looking kitchen with funeral arrangements. As they're going in further, they're attacked by a dog and it's a scruff to get away, but they do. And now they're further into the house and we see these three statues, speak no evil, hear no evil, and see no evil. We also see that there are flies everywhere and there's a certain smell, a really funky smell. There are locks on everything and Fool gets a little spooked, but Leroy talks him into staying. He's like, hey, you gonna get evicted. It's so crazy that Leroy is just like gaslighting this 13 year old. I think today, the day that this all takes place is his birthday. And he's just gaslighting this 13 year old boy into crime. <laughs> so Fool is still spooked and Leroy tells him, all right, fine, keep watch. Fool hears a noise and he goes down to the basement where he sees Spencer's gear. And while looking around, he trips a rope that closes and locks him in the basement. Um, he it trips a rope that closes and locks the basement door behind him. So he hears a TV leading him to see people down in the basement. People who are eating on a dead Spencer. And so we, uh, but we also learn that the gold at the very least is real because Spencer has at least one piece in his hand. So while Fool is observing that, um, Roach, who is one of the people down in the stairs. He comes in and scares a fool. 
I think he was actually trying to help him though. Like he's trying to scare him out of the house, but he can't speak because like the others who are all murmuring and shouting incoherently downstairs, he had his tongue cut out. All of them did. Alice is the one that lets Fool out of the basement, but she runs off before he can really like, hey, can you help me get out of here? Mama and Daddy come back noticing the car that uh, Fool and Spencer and Leroy were in. So Fool goes looking for Leroy and tells him about Spencer and they can't get out before um, Mommy and Daddy and the dog get back in. And so now they have to hide and all the doors have automatic locks. So while Leroy is hiding in the closet, he left Fool on his own, especially after Leroy is taken out. So Alice ends up showing uh, Fool the way through uh, floor vents, floorboards, and wall th through the actual wall leading him to an old bathroom so Al he finally meets alice and he's like how do i get out of here and he's like there's no way you can get out of here um and she's she's very scared right and he's like i'm not gonna hurt you, you ain't never seen a brother before and she's like i've never had a brother <laughs> and he's like no i mean a, a black guy and she's like uh no he's like have you ever been outside you know to the neighborhood and she's like what's a neighborhood outside she's like i'm not i'm not allowed outside and so she's ignorant very much in the sense that she does not know about the outside world but she does know about the people in the cellar so mommy and daddy wanted a perfect boy child but everyone would back talk they they wouldn't be as good as they wanted to so they finally got alice and she sees hears or speaks no evil and that's the only way to survive she also tells him that Roach is the one in the walls and daddy can't find him, which is why he regularly hunts him. So we find out that Alice has a secret way through the house, but it just really leads full further into the house. He's like, I don't want to go in, I want to go out. And Alice is like, sometimes in is out. Um, Mama, we see her cutting up Spencer and, and Leroy and she's feeding it to their guard dogs. They all just cannibalisms over here. Uh, when the police arrive and so mommy and daddy have to throw them out so they unlock the house um, as they're searching through the the van that Leroy was using mama figures out that fool is in the house as well with their little angels so just by being in there with Alice fool is a uh, what's the word not contaminating that's the word that I want to use um he's threatening her innocence he's a he's a threat to her innocence so um there fool is still running around from the dog leading daddy to find fool but roach ends up helping fool out he pulls him through the wall and so they're running through the walls and they end up in alice room and so we see that she has a mini dog collection of all of those who've seen too much people who had to be taken out who were rather taken out by mommy and daddy uh daddy and mommy find them and daddy shoots at roach and fool gets captured mommy makes alice clean up the blood before throwing her in a tub of boiling hot water like boiling hot water to clean her dress she's mommy's ranting about oh i just made you this white dress and now you ruined it you got blood all over it even though mommy was the one that threw her down in the pool of blood to clean it um daddy makes fool watch as he cuts up and feeds leroy to the people under the stairs before he throws fool in there and locks him in with them roach again helps him out but his wound is a fatal one and so before he he can't really help uh fool anymore but his dying breath he asks fool to save alice so fool makes it back to alice and they are once again running through their walls and daddy thinks that he's finally gotten fool when he's like shooting and stabbing through the wall but it's their beloved guard dog and so he's dancing around it's low-key kind of funny there's a bit of comedic uh humor to it he's like i got him 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 and mommy's like prove it and so he goes to show her but it's their dog so fool and alice make it to the attic and Fool tries to get Alice to go with him, but she's scared. There's a pond down below on the ground, and that's how Fool escapes. He jumps into that pond, and Daddy runs out to, like, continue shooting at him. And Mommy scolds Daddy for shooting outside. So Fool returns home with the gold coins, enough to pay off everything for his mom's operation, because she has cancer, is why she's sickly, uh, to keep from getting evicted, to go to doctor school as he wants, all of it. Um, but the grandpa lets him know that he should not go back and mess with them people who are siblings. They are not 
spouses they are siblings um and they they did run a funeral home their family did run a funeral home selling cheap coffins for high prices then they got into real estate and um the more money they got the crazier they got and rumors about them had been out forever since the grandpa was a kid but the police never took it seriously the fool tells ruby and his grandpa that he has to go back to save alice so he comes up with a plan that same night he calls the police and they come but again mommy and daddy have cleaned up and put a nice little cover on the police do find alice's room but mommy and daddy play it off as if she's no longer with them but mommy has a line that's like but in a sense she still lives here and always will after the cops leave, they lock the house back up, but the cops being there so long allow Fool to sneak back in. But mommy and daddy aren't stupid. They left a recording for Fool to find, and then they find him. But he fights back with a crowbar, which allows him to get away, and so they're thinking he's gotten back out, but he's really just hiding, trying to find where Alice is. And she is chained up in the attic. So Fool frees her, but daddy creeps in, and it's almost like he's on some sexual abusive type stuff, like he's walking towards her, grabbing his stuff. Uh, but before uh, he can see if she's tied up or not, because at this point Fool has untied her, mommy comes uh, and calls daddy back from the attic. So in a way, she saved Alice. Fool uh, then tells Alice that she's been kidnapped by them, that they're not siblings, they're not her real parents, rather that they're not spouses, they're not Alice's real parents, they're siblings, and she's been kidnapped. Alice is shocked and angry, and Fool's like, all right, we gotta get out of here, so do you wanna, you know, take a jump again? And Alice is like, no, he drained that pond, and he put a whole bunch of rocks and glass at the bottom, and he also kind of like taped up the house with a whole bunch of explosives, so be careful. So Alice and Fool, they're now up on the roof uh, where they hear mommy and daddy arguing about Alice. He wanted to take her out, uh, but mommy said no because Alice is her little angel. So they hear Fool on the roof leading daddy to shooting up the fireplace where Fool drops a brick on his face. And so mommy comes in, she comes down uh, under the fireplace and Alice and Fool jump down landing on her, her before uh, making it to the living room. So Fool sends Alice on. He's like, I have to, I'm not done with your fake parents yet. And I got to free the kids in the basement. You go on. So Alice is in the living room. Um, she's trying to figure out how to unlock the house. But Mommy catches Alice. And this time Alice fights back. And she uh, kicks her on the foot. She pushes her and she's like, go to hell. She's figuring out after finding out, you know, she's, they're not her real parents. Is like, I don't have to fear you. So um, she then runs and daddy comes downstairs and finds mommy injured. And she's like, you know, he turned, mommy's like, he turned our little angel against us. Uh, so now you, you have my permission to take her out. So Alice is hiding um, and it's full that distracts mommy and daddy from looking for her when uh, they hear the people in the basement. So they're like, oh, he's in the basement. So we got to go down there. So Fool is in the basement trying to set the others free. Um, and so daddy comes down to the basement and he's holding a gun on daddy, but he's on the stairs. And I don't know why Fool was on those stairs because he, know, he knows there's a latch that releases it that turns it into a ramp, which daddy does, making Fool fall down. But maybe it was all a part of his plan because he's a very smart 13 year old. Um... So a knock interrupts before daddy can kill Fool and it's Fool's sister. So mommy goes to answer it and uh, the people uh, from downstairs, the people under the stairs, um, they get free, kind of, or rather uh, it's a distraction. So grandpa and the sister and the whole town confront um, mommy and daddy, or rather mommy because she's the one that answered the door. Uh, and mommy's about to boom <laughs> um, Ruby but before she can Alice jumps down on her so since the people on the stairs are free Fool is saved by a couple of the brothers and they show him where the gold is but they also show him that it's laced with trip wires that will take out the whole house so Alice, Ruby, and the grandpa are searching for Fool but mommy gets loose and locks Alice back inside she uh Ruby goes to like search outside trying to see where mommy went and when she goes outside mommy locks the doors and Alice is trying to unlock the doors but it's an override so another system that they of locks that they have um and so she comes at Alice with the knife but the brothers burst through the stairs and the walls um and all these other places to get mommy and they they're 
taking bites out of her. Ultimately, Alice is the one who ends up, she has the knife now and she kind of stabs her. Um, and the mommy is like, you've hurt your mother. And Alice is like, you're not my mother. You never were. And so mommy pulls out the knife and is about to run back to Alice, but the people under the stairs, the brothers, they all attack mommy. Um, they then throw her body down the basement for daddy to see. And he realizes that fool has made it to the vault. So the brothers are trying to warn him. They're shouting out. But fool, quick on his feet, devises a plan. So he's holding the two wires. He's holding two specific wires together um, that are attached to explosives. And he's like, keep it up. And I'm going to take us all out. So daddy's going for him. And fool... He puts the two wires together and it blows the vault and really the entire house to pieces. And it's the end of daddy as he gets blown down uh, the pit. He drops bodies into a pit once he's done cleaning them. And so he falls right into that pit. Uh, so money rains down on the town folk and they are all scattering to get it. As Alice and Fool and the bros make it out. That's the end. Thoughts. Uh, this is something I watched at a really young age and actually enjoyed it. Mind you, I hate the horror genre. As I've gotten older, it's really because, like, a lot of the times it's just like, why are you putting yourself in that predicament? Like, you hear a baby crying in the attic and you ain't got no children and you still gonna stay there? But when I was younger, you know, I didn't like horror because Chucky scared the mess out of me. After I saw Chucky, like, all my dolls were dead. I gave them away. They were no longer mine. <laughs> um, but I was able to watch this with no problems. My only critique is watching it as an adult, because it's been years since I watched it. I watched it on VHS tape back in the day. Um, watching it as an adult on Tubi, because it is on Tubi right now. I feel like Fool and Alice's roles are that of older people. Now, one could argue that poverty and having to be the quote-unquote man of the house at age 13, um, aged up, rather, a 13-year-old fool considerably. And like I said, this all takes place on his 13th birthday, I think. Uh, but some of his lines may be considered older. Like, he has a line talking to one of the brothers under the stairs, and he's like, you can get out of here to the air, to the sun, to the women. What would you know about that? <laughs> what do you know about the women? What do you know about that? But again, one could argue the circumstances aged him up and, you know, a 13-year-old boy, hormones are just setting in. Alice, who I know, I don't know how old Fool was in real life, but Alice was played by a nearly 17-year-old girl. And so she has lines that when she's chained up in the basement uh, and Fool's like, hey, are you okay? And she, she's chained up and she's like, well, <laughs> indicating that, you know, not the greatest. And I don't know, it's just her sarcasm uh just comes off like a little older or a little something more than the innocent ignorant and i mean ignorance in the sense that she didn't even know what the neighborhood was so she's getting bolder and it's just that boldness that particular brand of boldness like comes off a bit older and then when she screams go to hell to mommy like um she pushes her and she's like go to hell and, like it's uh, there's a different voice change and everything like it just could be older um, there also are a few goofs that you can clearly see when you see the stand-ins or the stunt people. I'm not too hung up on that, though. Outside of that, if you're looking for a, perhaps a little unknown or rather forgotten suspense horror film with a tad bit of a comedic here and there, here you go. And I give it an 8 out of 10, taking off two points because, yeah, there were a few times where I did get a little squeamish and the critiques that I mentioned. Um... With that, let's kick it into our third and final segment, What Drives Me, where I give my commentary on something that drives me. Today's topic, not letting villains be villains. So I've tried to really ignore this. I made a few comments here and there online when I've seen people talking about it, but there's a prequel story to The Lion King that's about Scar, and basically in it, um, Scar and Mufasa are not blood brothers and Scar was taken in and um, Mufasa was taken in by Scar's family and then somehow he ends up usurping Scar in some way or sense I'm not trying to judge the film before it's even out because don't know it they could maybe come up with a really great story but also I am so tired I am so tired of villains having to have backstories like I've always been a 50 50 kind of gal on one hand it's definitely um oh yeah that villain is really not a villain but maybe an anti-hero or a morally great person they they do things that are you know destructive but they have reasons for why they do it 
or they were screwed over by the system so many times that they just became the villain that everyone wanted them to be like i kind of get it that's something that that could definitely be like driven into more that's a complex character and then i'm, I'm on this hand where it's like oh that's just a straight villain that's just a straight villain like oh they just doing it because they love destruction they love destruction. They want to be on top. They want the money and the power and it all. And the only way they can do that is, is by getting rid of all these people. They're being villainous for materialistic reasons. They just want power. They just want money. And you know what? Let them be villains. Let them be villains. Let the hero take them out and we root for the hero. Like, But now it's like we have to turn every villain into a morally gray character. Into an anti-hero into a complex character even when they're not like some villains like i said i've always been a 50 50 kind of gal so some villains aren't actually villains but they're anti-heroes or morally great characters who at least have reasons uh for doing what they do my number one uh villain who definitely rather person who could have escalated into a villain better than the way they wrote it katrina from the sleepy hollow show <laughs> like definitely her she been in purgatory for like 230 some years even while she down there, she see her husband falling for another person, another woman. She get out and she's very clear that her husband has fallen for this woman. He go get her, he go get her out of purgatory the very next day. The very next day. Um, he didn't he didn't rescue her. She's sitting here chilling with her old flame who putting all these insecurities in her head. Is Loki her her fate to be a villain? um her son got screwed over and she wants to reunite with her son she know other wifey don't like her she know other wifey is kind of leading her husband into having these thoughts um or rather seeing the true heart like she definitely could have been a villain a way better villain than they wrote her and you would have understood her she would have been a complex villain that you may or may not have rooted for but at the very least you understood because a lot of these times they'll give villains backstories not for you to root for them or to justify their their um actions but for you to just to understand she definitely would have been somebody you you see all the stuff that's happening to her so if she went full-on villain definitely under, understand and somewhat deserved uh loki's anti-hero arc was nicely done i'd say and one could compare him to scar but loki really was partially a spoiled brat who felt that he deserved uh more just because uh scar was actually ne next in line not defending scar but like scar was actually like ne next in line and you know mufasa loki bullied, bullied him or rather he wasn't the favorite so definitely you know they're they're different um loki was also dealing with an identity crisis because he found out that he wasn't odin's real son um even what they're doing with harley quinn's character is working out like she's still psychotic and doesn't care but like she's moving past just being toxic you know she's moving she's trying to better herself um i'm watching once upon a time in wonderland and the only compliment that i'll give that show i might come i might come try to do a review of it but i remember religiously watching that show when i was younger and i couldn't remember a thing about it and boy the only compliment i'll give that show is that um they're giving jafar and the red queen backstories and pretty nicely done for the most part like pretty nicely done uh magneto wanda dracula and all the other creatures of the night like see how they're what they're doing with peter pan and how the rewrites of today pan is the villain and hook is the anti-hero or at least uh, the morally gray character hades hades isn't all that he is that he's shown to be um as the older myths that just make him out to be an archetypal uh, devil like you know people who who have backstories <laughs> then you have characters like president snow who, who took on the the whole system of murdering children but at least we know why now because through a series of moral questions we're led to the conclusion that snow isn't just a psychotic uh tyrant but, but that he's a psychotic tyrant who feels that he's better than those in the districts because the og story definitely didn't tell us that scar who in his famous every villain has every especially every disney villain has their famous this is who i am pay attention to me i'm gonna tell y'all what's up with me song and his song in his song he has nazi imagery in it when the hyenas are marching and stuff that's nazi imagery um 
But he doesn't do those things because like he is evil and associated with that and is willing to take out his own family. No, he does these things because he was actually usurped by his non-blood brother Mufasa. Cruella, she, she doesn't want to take out Dalmatians because she just wants to make coats out of them. It's because the Dalmatians took out her mom. I mean, what's next? What's next? We're going to get Claude Frollo's backstory from the Hunchback. Gonna figure out how he became a sex repulsed genocidal pious tyrant. <laughs> like, please. I need y'all to let horrible villains be horrible villains. I think it all started with Maleficent for Disney. And that was a pretty decent twist, right? Like, she's a dragon shapeshifter. Of course, the kingdom fears what it doesn't understand. So they make her an outcast. It's deeper than just she cursed the baby because they didn't invite her to a party. Uh, but here's the thing. And this is the thing to pay attention to. She had room to be explored. As they have set it up, she had room to be explored. It's like, girl, you cursed the baby. Why you do that? But why you do that? Oh, they didn't invite you to the party. Not because, you know, they're scared of you. Why are they scared of you? She had room to be explored. Not every villain does. And we're getting to this point where we want to root for the morally great character because they make sense most of the time. Like Thanos, sure, Thanos made some sense you didn't fully root for him but at least you understood <laughs> um and that's something that's been happening in the book community for like ever as well uh but much like the book community y'all gotta learn who can and can't be morally great characters or the anti-hero like you don't get to do like completely horrible genocidal things and then say oh but they have a backstory every villain has a backstory this is how they got to that point no they don't they don't have a backstory. These are not complex characters. They're just villains and that's okay. Not every villain needs to be or even can be understood. We don't have to know why Snow from The Hunger Games feels better than those in the districts. Like we already know it was a war between the two and the capital people uh, wanted to be on top. It was us against them and they, they wanted to be on top. They wanted to be the victors. Uh, pretty freaking obvious from, with the information that we are presented in the OG concept. Scar and Mufasa have lines that confirm that they are blood brothers and in the story that they presented us. Um, Scar and Mufasa have lines that say that they are blood brothers. They confirm that. And Scar hates Simba for taking his spot in line to the throne. We also know that Scar was the outcast in his family without all this other information. I won't call a new because I guess there are different versions, but with the version that y'all have set up back in the night, stick with that. Stick with that. Um, but y'all made the choice to uh, align his villain song with Nazi imagery. You made that choice. That was a pretty strong choice and you made it. And now you want to say, oh, but it's not what you think. He actually had a reason. Yes, a very shallow one that was presented in the OG concept that y'all presented. Y'all presented the OG concept. Like... I keep saying I don't mind reboots, and I don't, uh, but at least let it be reboots that could stand to be rebooted. Uh, don't go out of your way to make a, to give the villain a backstory. And yes, I'm aware, like I said, it's not a backstory to justify their actions, but just so you can understand. But honestly, that suggests that you don't think that your friends, you think your friends are stupid. Um, they're not smart enough to understand what you've already set up. Because, like, when you're making all these prequels to these kind of stories, these aren't for kids. I mean, they're they're for kids, but it's also, like, Lion King came out in the 90s. So, if you're making prequels and sequels to that story, it's for those people who grew up with that. I'm all for, like, letting kids watch the older versions of Disney, some of the older versions of Disney and getting attached to those. My top five uh, renaissance, cause I don't even like the Lion King. I'm not like, I, this has irked me just cause y'all won't let villains be villains. Not even that I necessarily fully care about the story of the Lion King cause it's not even in my top five. Like um, I have a top five Disney renaissance and maybe the Lion King is my number six, but <clears throat> like y'all, y'all don't, y'all don't let, villains be villains and so i'm all for like letting children get attached to those and bring it forward but like making direct storylines to things that people grew up with it's not even just like nostalgia based it's that you're that's not a story that a kid today will understand the whole complete line to like do not go out of your way to make villains backstories that don't need it because a lot of the time villains are uh a lot of times the villains that y'all are expounding upon 
they're not complex characters that need expounding upon. They're not anti-heroes or morally great characters. They're just villains who do villainous things for the joy of being evil. Let them be. Let them be villains. Let them be evil. They are destructive because they want to be. Not every villain is... I, Y'all are really ruin this, ruining this for me. I will with quickness root for an anti-hero or someone to be an anti-hero or a morally great character. Um, not just because they're a crap person, because morally great characters still have to be liked and their reasons have to be understood. They can't just go around here murking everybody and then be like, that's what makes them a morally great character. No, morally great characters should still be liked and understood. But a lot of these times, like, again, you align Scar with that kind of imagery, that meant something that meant something you can't wash that away and, and say that no he has a backstory that leads to that i don't really care if his if his backstory leads to nazi-like imagery i don't really care like and again oh well it's not for you who was it for because it's not for kids today because they don't know the whole story because this is a prequel to a story that you started in the 90s people in the 90s kids in the 90s are grown now so like it couldn't be for the kids today i'm all for reboots i really am and prequels and i'm all for reboots being like actual reboots that build mm, slightly because if you're gonna do a whole reboot that doesn't have any of the uh aspects at all of the original come up with a new name too it's not a reboot of that story so it should to me still have some type of aspect of the original but still be a, a, the other one rather but still be original um i'm all for making prequel stories like uh star wars is one of those stories i guess where you could just forever prequel on prequel on prequel different parts of the universe i guess um so i'm never gonna hit on like just making prequels i do feel like all these sequels to like years old movies let, let it go let it go but definitely <laughs> let villains be villains that's all i got to say let villains be villains sometimes people do evil stuff for no other reason than just to be mean-spirited and evil and we do not have to understand their ways to see how they got there like because even if you're not making these prequels to like um justify their actions you're giving people a reason to sympathize with them and it's like mind you his story leads to him with nazi imagery i don't care like some of these villains are not complex characters that can be built their complexities can be built upon they're just evil to be evil let them be with that that is uh what drives me and that is kaya's commentary if you like this episode like this episode leave a thumbs up leave comments down below let me know any of your thoughts and opinions on any of the segments that i had be respectful we can have a conversation with one another but only if we are respectful don't forget to follow on all my social media thanks for listening thanks for watching see you next time